This is Support is Sexy, episode 132, with Carmen Jones, CEO of Solutions Marketing Group. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I interview inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and their lessons to help you take your business and your life to the next level and create something sexy. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for another episode of Support is Sexy. If you listened yesterday, then you know that we have a brand new opening again today. We had a new one yesterday. We have a new one today. And that is because before the new year, I went away and went out of town just for the weekend, a few days away in the sun. And the votes were in for the new theme song. And it was another song leading the song we had yesterday, the hip hop old school beat that I thought you all liked came back looked at Twitter, and saw that the bongo beat won. So I redid the intro because I am a woman of my word, and I wanted to go with the beat that you all voted for. So I hope you like the new intro. That's what we're rocking with in 2017. It's going to be a good year. I'm claiming it right now for you and for me. And today, I am so happy, first of all, to have you here. You know it just would not be the same without you. And I am thrilled to have our guest today, Miss Carmen Jones. And Carmen, is the CEO of Solutions Marketing Group. And I love Carmen's company, one, because she's so passionate about it, but also because she focuses on a market that is often way too underserved, the disability market. And Carmen focuses on this market, one, because as I said, she's passionate about it, but also because of her personal experience, having gone through an accident many years ago, which caused her to become a paraplegic. And she talks about how this market is not considered by employers or considered by companies that are marketing to different segments of the population. They look at multicultural markets and other markets, but the disability market is underserved. And Carmen, Carmen is filling that void and helping companies learn how to serve this market. It's so smart, a great idea, and just a great thing to do as a company. So some of the things you'll learn on this episode from Carmen are the importance of market research, also how to utilize speaking engagements to your advantage. I thought this was a great tip. She also talks about the power of the disability market, the difference between accessibility and accommodations, an important difference there. Lessons she learned from her chair. Be sure to listen out for that. Also, the top three misconceptions about people with disability and also how companies should consider the disability market. It's bigger than you think. So Carmen gives great insight, great information. I so appreciate her sharing openly her experience and how she's building this business that really is an extension of her, of who she is as a person. So, you know, for more information and the resources Carmen mentioned, she mentioned some books and some organizations that we should all be aware of. Go to supportissexypodcast.com. Just search Carmen, C-A-R-M-E-N. Her show notes page will come up. All the links, all the resources, all the notes will be there. Have a look. You can get everything that you need. All right. Thank you so much for listening. So without further ado, Carmen Jones. So, Carmen, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be on as well. Excellent. Now, first question. When did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? I would say it was probably about 18, 19 years ago um, when I just recognized the opportunity that I had to create something that no other, very few businesses had done Um regarding targeting, helping companies target the disability market. And what I love about being an entrepreneur is the nimbleness, the flexibility, of course, I know a lot of people like that. Um, I also love when I see my clients, when I can work closely with them, and I can see them have their aha moment. Um, And that's really thrilling to me. Excellent. Now, where did you grow up? I grew up all over the place. My dad worked for IBM, Mm -hmm. which in our case means I've been moved. (laughs) (laughs) So we moved a total of seven times um, by the time I was in college. And 
you know, uh, we l- really volleyed between the Midwest and the East Coast, specifically in Illinois. We lived there a couple times outside of Chicago. And then I would say my most formative years were in New Jersey, um, in North Jersey, in a town called Ramsey, which is about an hour outside of Manhattan. And is that where you are now in Ramsey still? No, no. I'm in Arlington, Virginia. Oh, I've you're lived- in Virginia. I am. Yeah, I am. So I'm in Northern Virginia. I am the first city right outside of the district. Mm -hmm. And I've lived here since 1991. All right. Now, what was a young Carmen like as a little girl? (laughs) Well, I think, um, you know, there were a lot of experiences that shaped who I am now and who I was then. So because we moved so much, um, we were often the only minority family or black family in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at life through that lens. When we moved to Wheaton, Illinois in 1975, I think, um, we were the first black family to move into a subdivision and the neighbors sent around a petition for us to not move in. Oh no. Yeah. Um, And it was the first time I I was in third grade. It was the first time I heard the N word. It was the first time I experienced comments like, well, we can play at school, but you can't come over to my house. And I'm sorry um, you experienced that. I am as well, but I'm grateful that my siblings nor I are bitter. And I think, you know, Elaine, it really opened me up to um, issues of equity it opened me up a lot, to, and I didn't know it then, you know, until I got much older. It opened me up to um, having to be bold in the midst of when when others would maybe assume I would have been quiet, um, and and not in a in a, a braggadocious in, in a way like that, but mm-hmm. in a way that I had to really just stand up for myself. And so I I was thinking um, this morning about the fact my first market research study (laughs) was when I was um, probably in the second or third grade. Mm -hmm. And I and I love the Jackson five. And I also remember that the Partridge family or um, the Brady Bunch was on. I think it was the Partridge family. And I went around the neighborhood and I took a market research study door to door. And I asked my predominantly white neighbors, um, which they preferred, the Jacksons or the Partridge family. <laughs> now, what was this research for? Something you were working on or your own curiosity? My own curiosity. I don't know what, no, now looking back, I'm like, wow, my mother and father let me just go out and survey, <laughs> survey the whole neighborhood. But right. I really wanted people to, I wanted to understand what people like better because in my mind, there were, it really was no no competition with the Jacksons, right. but I, w- I wanted to have some data to back it up. And looking <laughs> back on <laughs> some empirical back, data. Yes, I needed it. And looking back, I thought what, what courage or boldness must have resonated inside of me and confidence that I didn't really fully understand. And what do you think that was that was in you? What, what were some of your, what were some of your influences growing up? So, of course, my parents and, and, you know, living in the midst of a lot of different situations and moving a lot, I'm really grateful that my mother always modeled uh, asking for the goodness in people. And I don't ever recall her making racist comments. I don't recall when we came home crying about some of the things we encountered at school, um, her saying things that were negative. She always would spin it in a positive way. Um, my dad, because uh, of his business experience and just watching him, um, just gave me a sense for business and understanding what it means to be a trailblazer. My dad was hired by IBM the year after the Civil Rights Act became a law. Mm. And so just watching him navigate the corporate space um, was something thing that wasn't lost on me. And I would also say some of my great influences is my extent are my extended family. Um, I I became a paraplegic in 1986 as a result of a car accident. Mm -hmm. And my family I have there's a total of 13 grandchildren um, on my mom's side. And my cousins, my aunts and uncles, they've all rallied uh, for everything that I've done been very supportive and you know i i cherish and adore my family for that 
Now, what, at the moment you became a paraplegic, you said it was a car accident 18 years ago? Um, 30 years ago. 30 years ago. 30 years 30 ago. 30 years ago. Yep. I was uh, in my junior year at Hampton University. Oh, Hampton. That's right. Our home by the sea. It is. Now, can you tell us about that um, incident and what was life like just before that accident? And then what was it like or what were you like after that accident? Sure. So um, this happened in November of 1986. I had just pledged a sorority. I was a student leader in the student leadership program. Mm -hmm. I was living off campus and I had a car. And I also had a job, a part-time job at Casual Corner. Mm. Many of your listeners may remember that store. (laughs) Yes, I remember. (laughs) Yes. And you could get those nice suit pairings and all those (laughs) little coordinated outfits. Yes. Um, and I, I was, you know, living the life. I was popular. I was, you know, excited. Hampton really excited me and being a part of the Hampton family was really a wonderful experience. And so my friends and I were together um, during the Thanksgiving vacation. We decided the, th- the Saturday after Thanksgiving to drive up to Richmond to possibly attend a party. We were kind of bored that weekend. Um, And on our way back, um, I was driving, we had this accident. And, um, you know, I was 20 years old, I was, I, I don't know how when I look back on that, how I really rallied and got myself together. Um, I was in the hospital for a total of six months. Uh, the Hampton family, you know, Dr. Harvey, um, some other uh, key senior administrators were really um, supportive of my returning back to school. So less than a year after the accident, I returned to Hampton. It was a total step of faith. Um, my 5'10 body, uh, you know, became dependent upon a wheelchair for my mobility. And Hampton at that time wasn't wheelchair accessible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some of the engineers had me literally point out where I wanted them to put curb cuts. Um, I had a a room, a single room in a dorm in McGrew Towers, the the most modern dorm at that time. Um, And so it was really an effort to get back into my life and get my education. It was scary. <laughs> I can it, imagine. It was, um, it was, I was grieving, you know, mm-hmm. I was on campus um, as a five foot 10 young woman and I'm rolling around. All the buildings weren't accessible. I had, you know, sorority sisters and some of my friends carry me up steps and going to dances and I couldn't dance or I didn't think I could. Um, you know, just all of those things, it, it really brought out my grieving process. But it also, while I was going through it, it helped me to kind of reset and re reprioritize my life. And um, faith is a big component of who I am um, as a Christian. And I I had, you know, my friends were telling me wonderful things. My family, they were telling me wonderful things. But I knew at the end of the day that I had to, I had to lean and be anchored by my faith because day to day things could change. But I knew that if God had me, um, I would be all right. (laughs) You would be all right. And it sounds like, too, that you did have um, a great group of friends and people there to support you uh, emotionally, but then literally like carrying you into some buildings and things like that. And I would imagine that that was an important part of the healing process, too. It definitely was because it, it, it created boundary free relationships. It created seamless opportunities for me to just be and mm-hmm. not have to explain. Um, and it also demonstrated a level of value that my friends placed on me as a person that no matter what my body looked like, they still loved me and cared for me. And they didn't think of me as an inconvenience. And I'm very indebted to Hampton for uh, embracing me back in that way. And I think it's beautiful how that has evolved into um, the work that you do today with the company that you've created. And But did you come out of school right away wanting to be an entrepreneur or did you have other ideas at that time once you did make it through school? So when I graduated, I was probably, 
and a handful, there were probably more, but it seemed like in my circle that everybody had a job Mm -hmm. except, except me. What was your major? Marketing. Okay. Marketing was my major. And I really, um, was bothered by this. And, and when I went through the interview process, my senior year, there was no one in the career planning and placement office to really help me understand what looking like a job was like as a person with a disability. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we were all kind of making it up as we went. (laughs) And, you know, I had recruiters ask me really inappropriate questions like what my long term prognosis was. Mm. Could I move my feet? <laughs> um, how could I fly to business meetings? And, you know, honestly, at that stage and at that young age, my primary goal was to help them become comfortable with me so that they would I would debunk any myths that they had and misgivings they had right. so that, you know, I really had a shot. Um, So I graduated without a job. Um, uh, At that time, a story was written about me in the local Hampton paper. A man who ran a nonprofit organization um, read the article. You know, it was focused on my returning back to school and graduating. He contacted Hampton. Hampton contacted my parents and he invited me. You know, my parents relayed the message that he wanted to invite me for an uh, interview. And I ended up working at a Center for Independent Living, which is a nonprofit organization that's run by people with disabilities to provide services to people with disabilities to help them achieve their goals towards independence. And Elaine, the beautiful thing about that is that while I um, managed a caseload of about 50 different clients, um, While I was helping them achieve their goals, it was like I was counseling myself Mm -hmm. and really helping to bridge my acceptance in terms of being an African-American woman who also had a physical disability. And so I look back on that job with great fondness. I don't look back on it with fondness with how much I made. It was only $16,000 a year. year. That's a fortune um, when you're just getting out of college, right? It was. It was. (laughs) And and I stayed there a couple of years. And then I moved to the D.C. area in 1991 when I uh, accepted a position with the federal government. Interesting. Now, the position with the federal government, was that something that you sought out? Or how did that position come about? I did. They had a career fair um, Mm -hmm. for young professionals. And I went and went, you know, it wasn't specifically targeting people with disabilities. I went with a whole lot of energy and I was hired pretty quickly um, at the Department of Transportation. And I worked in other agencies in the government um, to include the Department of Interior um, and also later the Department of Agriculture. So I I have had a good federal experience, but I always have felt this draw, this pull Mm -hmm. towards being an entrepreneur. And, you know, as a when entrepreneurship, um, when I watched and observed entrepreneurs 15, 20 years ago, it looked very different than it does now. And now, um, you know, it's more lifestyle focused. A lot, a lot of it's based on virtual environments. So, you know, there are many more tools. There are many more resources to support success. And at what point did you decide then um, to give in to that poll and say, you know what, I'm going to step out on my own and, and try to create a business that really reflects who I am and, and the market I want to serve? You know, I had to really pursue this um, carefully because, I, you know, as I did a, la- a survey of the landscape, there weren't a lot of companies that seemed to care about reaching consumers or people with disabilities as consumers. Um, there were, you know, my very first client was American Express. And I often joke that if you're going to have a first client, <laughs> that's, that's, a a really, that's a good one to have. And my second one was Darden Restaurants. And I started to notice a rhythm. Um, and, and at the time when I got these two clients, I was still working mm-hmm. for the government. And I started to learn notice a rhythm between if I go to events and I speak, I was at least having the opportunity to get in front of decision makers. And if I could follow up with them and meet with them, I could close. And so once I started to uncover what that rhythm was in terms of getting new business, um, with a lot of support from my then husband, we're no longer together. Um, I decided to take the leap and 
I, I really haven't looked back. It's been really exciting, um, exciting work. Now, at the, when you say speak at events, do you mean you were on panels or do you mean sort of networking events or going up to people who were on panels? What way did you use <laughs> well, or all, all of the above? What way did you use speaking as a tool for you? So because disability, um, the disability market is so niched, I would often present um, different topics for conferences focused on diversity and inclusion or multicultural marketing. So I would be a speaker of, of a workshop or you know, mm-hmm. a concurrent session. I'm also, um, I guess my what I did when I was in the second grade with my market research study, my important study, right. helped give, give me a boldness to just go up to people and just ask them, you know, do you have any events coming up? Um, I'd love to do a webinar with you. Um, well, how about we do that? And so that has also been helpful, but, you know, Speaking at events um, as a panelist or as a keynote or, you know, a workshop presenter has been a really valuable tool for me. Is that something you still utilize today? I'm sure you probably do more so now. Yeah, I definitely do. Um, For instance, I was on a panel about a month and a half ago in New York City. And, you know, it was not, it was a panel at four o'clock in the afternoon in New York, getting around New York City on wheels as a wheelchair user is not for the faint of heart. Mm -hmm. And so as I was navigating my way to the building, I kept thinking, why am I doing, (laughs) why am I doing this? This, It's just, it was cold and all of that. And I couldn't find the accessible entrance into the building and, you know, got there spoke for probably 10 minutes, honestly, maybe a total of 10, 15 minutes, but the networking opportunity paid off. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to connect with a couple of different potential clients. And, you know, there's nothing like having that face-to-face contact. We do a lot of things virtually, but sometimes face-to-face is what's needed to help build confidence. And uh, not only for myself, but also for the people that I'm looking to work with. Do you think that's something then that you advise other uh, women entrepreneurs, especially to look into ways to, if, even if people can't, for those listening uh, right away, speak at an event. But I think what you mentioned is saying to someone, you know, I'd love to give you, you know, do a free workshop for you or do a webinar, you mentioned, um, to do a webinar with someone. Is that the kind of things that you would recommend people look into? De- definitely. I mean, you, you building relationships is going to be the fuel for your business success, I believe. Um, And so, you know, finding out, doing research and finding out what events are coming up for 2017 is definitely important. Starting now, you know, next week will sort of be a down week for a lot of companies um, and organizations that first week of the year. Starting now in terms of identifying who some of the key decision makers are and reaching out to them and presenting your ideas for topics um, and it may even require you pay your own way to get to the conference. Right. And that, that's OK, <laughs> because what will occur if you use that opportunity well um, will hopefully land you more business. Now, at what point did you then officially launch your company, which we should tell everyone is called Solutions Marketing Group? Um, I know you had American Express and Darden Restaurants, did you say? Was another yes. client. At what point yes. did you say, OK, I'm going to do this. This is it. Or was it before or after those two clients? It was before then. Mm-hmm. It was definitely in the late 90s. Um, but I still was working. I still was employed um, with a government agency. Um, and then personally, during that time in 2001, I had my first child. My first child was born with significant health challenges. So it became really important that I have um, some stability and some access to good health care mm-hmm. because his needs were so great. Um, and so, you know, while I, la- while I started the business in 1998 and I was working part time and also managing clients and taking care of my family and my son, um, I really went full solo out in 2006. And, um, you know, it was it was exhilarating. There was a book that some friends and I read called If You Want to Walk on Water, You Got to Get Out of the Boat. Mm. And we all call ourselves water walkers. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, from a biblical passage about Jesus calling Peter out into the water. And we we use that as a frame of for ourselves to determine, you know what, we got to be very clear um, that we're understanding what it means for us to take this step of faith. And so 
you know, we could, I, I felt like I was out on the water with water, uh, you know, figuratively sloshing around my feet. And it was just a thrilling experience to be back out there. Were there any moments of fear while you were out on that water, though? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. How did you get yeah. that? Did you get through with, with the, it sounds like you have a great group of friends and then books like this one. Who's by? Do you know who it's by? I'll have a link it to is. it. But. Sure. It's um, by John Ortberg, O-R-T-B-E-R-G. Okay. So. Um, yeah, there were moments of fear. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you may have any entrepreneur understands that no two days are the same. And there's some days that you feel like, man, I am so on top of my game. And then you get some not so great news from a client or they're not quite pleased with the direction you're going on a project. And, you are you know, if you're like me, your mind starts to race and you're like, oh, my God, oh, my God, what's going to happen? Mm-hmm. Um, so in those moments, you really have to. I, for myself, I get quiet. I really go back to my big why for why I started this company. Um, and then, you know, I, I really work intentionally to course correct and to work with my client to make sure that they understand we're hearing them and that we're doing everything that we know to do um, to be able to support them well. And at the end of the day, I want my clients what in whatever level they are in their organization to not only feel good about the work that we've done, but to also become, an, if you will, an evangelist within their organization to share with others why disability marketing is very important and how their company can benefit and gain market share. What would you say is your big why? You said you go back to that um, to sort of, it sound like, sounds like to get centered or recentered. What would you say your big why is for your business? So the big why for me personally um, is that I started this company to normalize disability, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. In the same way that the African-American market, Asian, LGBT markets have all been normalized where companies and organizations make it a priority to target these groups I've, I've really focused on ways that I can normalize disability. And honestly, Elaine, it's an outgrowth of my personal experience. Um, and I think for me, the big why has also been linked to transforming uh, client culture, you know, the corporate culture. And that is that to me, hearing my clients say, you know what, Carmen, because of what we've done, we've been able to do X, Y, Z or achieve X, Y, Z. It drives me. That's, that is my big why. And of course, I recognize it's directly connected to my purpose. Um, and if I you know, can, it's, it's a silver lining from a really unfortunate situation that happened 30 years ago. But it has been the catalyst to propel me into so many wonderful new directions. And so that is, you know, a part of my why. Excellent. Now, does Solutions Marketing Group, do you, uh, I would imagine you help companies market to the disability market, but then do you also help companies that want to employ individuals with disabilities as well? Do you provide that information to them? Absolutely. Um, We recognize, just to give all the listeners a little background, there are 56 million people in the United States, according to the Census Bureau, that have a disability. Mm -hmm. And that can include people who use wheelchairs, people who are blind or low vision, people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Also, people who have hidden or invisible disabilities, um, people who may have some form of mental health uh, disability, someone may have chronic fatigue, they may have a a chronic health condition that people don't readily recognize. And so what we do um, is we really meet clients where they are initially to understand what they want to accomplish Um, And then we help move them to understanding how to penetrate the market and then retaining the market. Regarding employment, um, there are 10 percent. Well, I'm sorry. The unemployment rate is, I think, uh, 4 percent right now. And the unemployment rate for people with disabilities is more than double that. So Mm -hmm. people want to work. 
And so I initially, when I started the company, um, we saw ourselves as an ad agency for companies to be able to target the disability market. But as we have worked with clients, we have to peel back the layer to lay some foundational steps, which include employment, because company cultures change when they have people inside the company that can help drive what the company's public face looks like to diverse markets. So employment is a really important piece of what we do. So we um, work with our clients to definitely look through their recruitment plans, understand where they can um, tap new talent, really work to train their staff, their recruiting staff, also their diversity and inclusion staff to understand the untapped opportunity of reaching um, this group of people who want to work and haven't always had the opportunity to be considered. Why is it important, do you think, for businesses to really pay attention to this niche? Um, We all, you know, everyone talks about the importance of having a niche or focusing on a niche, but why is this particular market very important? Well, if you look at multicultural marketing, really every group has been focused, has had focus. Mm -hmm. Um, With regards to the disability community or disability market, for some reason, it's this last um, group of people that companies haven't quite figured out. And what makes it trying and, you know, I get in philosophical conversations with my peers is that, you know, the federal government has made requirements for companies, federal contractors to hire people with disabilities. Um, And a lot of them are starting to really become more aggressive uh, in doing so. But we want to help them eliminate the barriers. You'll hear from from employers things like, well, how do we accommodate people Or how do we find qualified talent? Um, And we really work with them to, one, uncover that it's not as difficult. The process to go about accommodating or recruiting folks is not difficult. And really give them the tools and resources they need to guide them through that process of how to do it. And in some cases, we tell them how to do it. In some cases, we work alongside their team to help them do it and implement it well. Something that I noticed uh, recently, uh, speaking of um, accommodations, I noticed your company hosted a webinar about accessibility versus accommodations. Right. Right. What do business owners need to know about the difference between the two? What do we all need to know? Sure. So the distinctions are that with regards to accessibility, um, there are some specific requirements from the Americans with Disabilities Act that not only focuses on the built environment um, in terms of um, access and um, doorway widths, et cetera. There are also some requirements that are focused on website accessibility. So if someone is blind or and they use a, a device called a screen reader, they want to be able to navigate through the site to be able to have equal access as their sighted peer. So there are certain um, requ- technical requirements that companies have to build into their websites to ensure accessibility. With regards to accommodations, it's the distinction is how do companies um, take initial steps to be able to accommodate people so they're successful in the workplace. So an accommodation may include Um, providing that assistive technology like a screen reader. It may be changing the configuration of a workstation for someone to be able to work from a wheelchair or if they have some limited mobility. Mm -hmm. Um, It is whatever, an accommodation focuses on what can we um, add to that built environment so that someone can seamlessly be able to interact and interface with not only the activities and essential functions of their job, but also their peers. Excellent. Now, what would you say are three, maybe three of the biggest mistakes or maybe misconceptions that businesses have uh, about working with the disability market or employing people from the market? So um, I think some of the mistakes are that companies feel they need a lot of data um, to help spur them on or to act as a catalyst for why they need to target the market. Um, I think that sometimes companies become a bit overwhelmed with looking at the diversity of disabilities. So for instance, 
you know, and I had a conversation with someone recently about this, you know, the way you reach people who are blind, the way you reach people who are deaf or hard of hearing, the way you reach people who are wheelchair users may be a bit distinct, but sometimes they get a little overwhelmed by that and they don't know exactly what to do. And sometimes that can become a barrier. Um, and I think also that they have challenges with finding talent and they don't know exactly how and where to look for talent. Um, and, you know, what we do is work with them to identify a myriad of resources locally and nationally so that they can have access to, to qualified folks with disabilities so they can work. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things with your company, I know you're, um, as we mentioned, you're focusing on helping companies market to the group and employ people from the disability market. But you also say we care about the families of the people we push for because it's never just about one. We care about integrating disability, erasing stigmas and bashing stereotypes. So why is that um, important to you, especially as a person with a disability and uh, someone who's gone through sort of being um, boxed in, for lack of a better word, um, by stereotypes when you were younger? Why is all of that, do you think, so important for you to bring to your business as part of the work that you do every day? Well, because I've one, because I've lived it Mm -hmm. and I know what is what was required of me to bash those stereotypes and to outperform and overperform more than my peers. Um, I think that there's a, a prevailing feeling and, and thought that a lot of people, that what people focus on is what people cannot do. So in their understanding of a person with a disability, they focused on how this person is different. Um, and sometimes they project their feelings in that, you know, if someone can't see, they project, gosh, how would I feel if I couldn't see? Well, how how can they figure out how to catch a bus and take care of their family and all that? Mm-hmm. And so there's so many of my peers and so many of my colleagues who just live their life the way you do, Elaine. Mm-hmm. I mean, they have families, they travel, they go to concerts, they, you know, I'm having dinner with friends tomorrow night. One is a wheelchair user, one is deaf, and we're going to have a great time. And so we just do what we do. So, you know, part of what I've seen in the 30 years since my uh, car accident is that more people are, because society has changed and they're more, um, they're more, there's more access to restaurants and shops and movies, people are out. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, people are seeing, when I say people, the general population is seeing us out doing what we do, living just like other folks. So it's important to me to bash those stereotypes and integrate disability into any client's uh, workplace so that other people can, other people coming behind me can thrive so that they can have access to the same opportunities that I've been able to have access to. And as a parent who had, my child died um, in 2009 due to some other, thank you. Um, As a parent who had a child with significant disabilities, it's important for me to demonstrate to my clients that when you're reaching that individual with a disability, it has a ripple effect where you're reaching so many more people. So my family was impacted directly and has been impacted directly by the access and opportunity that I've been able to have. And as a result, you don't just get me as a consumer, you get my, you know, my daughter, you get my parents, you get my siblings, you get all the people who travel with me. And that becomes a more lucrative uh, opportunity for the company or for a, cl- for a company. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. That's powerful. I, I think, um, as you said, you bring, in other words, you bring so much with you or so many with you into yes. what you do every day. Yes. And um, a question, do you also, for people listening or for companies that might be interested in contacting you, uh, do you also on the other side, help your peers get jobs within different industries? Like, is there any part of your business that is about prepping people for going into, whether it's corporate America or any kind of position, if they happen to have a disability? Or do you You focus more on the client, uh, the company side? We focus more on the company side. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, based on -on one-on-one relationships that I have, especially with young people, um, we work to, or I've worked to help, share what I've learned along my journey to help them benefit. 
Um, though two, 10 years ago, a client, no, I'm sorry, 10 years ago, a colleague and I created a scholarship called the Inclusion Scholars Program. We've teamed with the Thurgood Marshall College Fund to help students with disabilities who wish to attend historically black colleges um, per, get the needed support in addition to a scholarship. We have a program component and also a scholarship component. So the end goal is that they are able to work that you know we're preparing them for employment we want them to have the rich experience that comes from an hbcu Mm -hmm. but we also want to help prepare them for the workforce Um, is that scholarship still active now it is uh, active however we are in the process of raising funds for the scholarship and the program okay so um Stay tuned. I'm hoping 2017 will be a really great year for the ISP. Oh, excellent. Keep me posted. I'll be sure to link to anything that that any information that you have on it and um, certainly to support in any way that I can. I appreciate it. Thanks. Absolutely. Now, as a woman, what has entrepreneurship taught you about yourself? Wow. Um, (laughs) I think for me, (laughs) that's loaded. I think for me, um, my disability has given me a confidence that I did not at, you know, 20 years old, I didn't know that I was lacking or that I didn't know that I could, um, I could unearth uh, the courage to become the person that I am. And um, as a woman, I enjoy, I have been blessed to benefit from other women pouring into me and sharing with me, you know, any tricks, any, um, any providing advice and guidance, opening doors for me, making phone calls, sending emails, et cetera. And I love the the camaraderie and the support that women give each other. Um, And it's been really a joy to have, young women and young entrepreneurs come to me in the same manner that I went to other women and to be able to nurture and guide them and provide support and cheer for them. And so I think it's this wonderful, quiet, well, it's not so quiet. It's a sisterhood, if you will, of women who can support each other. And we're not into one upping each other. Um, I'm not a competitive person by nature. And, And in the moments when I feel myself getting competitive Um, I remind myself there's enough for every single one of us. Mm -hmm. There is enough. (laughs) And and if you, if you live, well, I was going to say if you live right, but if you play this right, it is to your benefit that you pull someone with you um, who may even be a competitor and it disarms that competition. It, it provides and strengthens your team. So I, I find it wonderful to be a female entrepreneur now, especially now, and uh, look forward to being able to support other women and cheer for them. Excellent. Now, what would you say is your vision for your company in 2017? I was going to say long term moving forward, but if you're just thinking about next year, what are your hopes for yourself and for the business? Sure. Um, this year, I personally, I want to start a book that I have been waiting for the right time and there's no right time to now start. is the time Carmen I'm telling <laughs> now you is the now time. is the time I know I know and it started Elaine with me trying to wax eloquent on Facebook and it was, I call them divine downloads it's these little wisdom things that come into me and I just post it on Facebook and I'll just say at the end lessons from my chair and what I've what I've learned is that in my case, my chair, my disability is the thing that has made transformed my life in the in the best way. But at, initially, it was something that could have really broken not only broken my spirit, but really have just left a cloud over my life. Mm -hmm. And I recognize that every single one of us have a quote chair. We have that thing that could either make us or catapult us. And if you're quiet enough and you listen to your heart and listen to your friends, you'll be able to uncover what that chair is and, and, get direction. And I, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking in terms of just inspiration in terms of how that chair in your life can transform your life. So I want to write this book That's <laughs> called good. Lessons, 
Lessons from my my chair. That's good, Carmen. Now is the time. It is time. It is. It is. And people, whenever I post, all my friends will say, okay, so when does the book come out? When is the book? Right. So it's Um, you could gather probably what you've already written and repurpose it along with some new things, I would imagine. That is the plan. That is definitely the plan. And then for my business, um, I want to do a lot of things differently in terms of collaborating with other women. Um, So I'm meeting with some strategic partners in early uh, early this year, next year, um, to really talk about how we can collaborate and create different webinars and boot camps for to serve clients. I also would love to do more speaking. Um, so I plan to network and, and take care of that because, again, as I speak, I don't not only have the opportunity to inspire and share, but I also have opportunity to discuss um, any business uh, that may be coming. Um, and then I'm planning to create the disability market boot camp for small businesses because I'm often contacted by companies that want what they can do to reach this group of consumers, but they can't afford to pay for my services. So I want to create a, a program for them where I teach them um, through four to six weeks what they need to do to be successful. And then uh, there'll be a coaching component. And then lastly, a disability master class for corporate clients and larger clients to be able to um, take those initial initial steps to understand, penetrate, and retain um, not only consumers with disabilities, but also employees. So that's my 2017 vision. Wow. Um, <laughs> I'm glad then, I did just ask about 2017. <laughs> that's amazing. Well, you know, now we got to get it done. And, right. and then and then lastly, I want to also get my 8A cert- certification so I can uh, have a bit more agility to do business with the government. Oh, that's awesome. All those things are going to come come true for you or manifest for you. I I believe it. Clear vision. I believe it too. (laughs) I believe it listening to you. Thank you. Of course. In closing, if you think over your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? Ooh. Wow. Um, this is that was an unexpected question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm I'm really thinking it through. Mm-hmm. I think the person I would thank would be my former husband, mm-hmm. Carlton. Um, and this is why when I was just talking about Solutions Marketing Group, he was always encouraging me to pursue it, and. He, you know, would often look over things that I wrote or, you know, would he's he attended events that I participated in and he would offer some creative and critical thoughts in terms of how I could enhance what I did. Um, So I would thank him because, you know, without agreeing for me to take this initial step and the income uncertainties and all of that, I wouldn't have taken the steps. So. Um, what I would say to Carlton is thank you. I wholeheartedly um, and gratefully thank you for uh, the support and the encouragement you provided as I took the step of faith to to use my life in a bigger way. Oh, that's beautiful, Carmen. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Well, I, I wasn't expecting it, so I'm glad to have the opportunity to answer that most authentically. Yes, that was beautiful. Now tell us, how can we support you? Give everyone your website. Well, I forgot to talk about this earlier. I don't know if this was on purpose. I'm sure it was intentional. You seem like that kind of person. Disability-marketing being your web address is so smart. Thank you. Thank you. so smart, I would imagine. I don't know, was that intentional to to have that? Because it's such a, it would be a big search term, I would imagine. Or was it just, (laughs) that was what's available well, I, I thought about it creatively. Disability was taken. Disability marketing worked because that is, that encapsulated yes. what I do. Exactly. What I do. Yeah. All right. So now, tell us how can we support you? Well, when we have, you know, I want folks to follow me on LinkedIn, of course, and also on Twitter. Um, and so, when we have events, when we speak at events, when we have webinars, I'd love for you all to participate. I want you to tell your colleagues to participate because 
when we educate folks, we change their paradigm and their understanding about disability and what what it means to have a disability. And it opens people up um, to be more inclusive. For instance, I uh, shared with a friend who I've known for probably 10 years, and she knows what I do. And she spoke, she went to an event recently where the president of Gallaudet University, which is a university in the District of Columbia, the nation's only um, university uh, that's primarily for folks who are deaf, for students who are deaf. Um, and the president was speaking and she said, based on what she heard that morning at this event and what I've shared with her over the years, she now is going to work really diligently and, and, and intentionally in 2017 to hire people with disabilities. Mm. And so, you know, if you just think about it, Elaine, if someone with a disability is, is given an opportunity and they're hired, that can change the trajectory of their life. You know, employment is a big deal for every group, but for folks with disabilities who have historically been left out, it's a huge accomplishment to go back to work, to go to work or go back to work um, after an injury or accident or illness. And so as a result, my friend Bridget is now able to share with her clients where I was also an entrepreneur and she can share with her clients the benefits she's gained and hopefully raise their awareness, shifted their paradigms and encourage them, encourage them to do the same and follow her, um, follow her in, in disability employment. So, you know, I, I really um, am excited about where we are as a country because it seems now more opportunities are open to folks with disabilities, including myself and I think really in 2017, we're going to break through some ceilings and shatter some stereotypes. And I'm excited about it. I'm excited, too. Now, you mentioned LinkedIn for you and the company. Where can people I'll have links to everything. But just for those listening, if they want to go look at it now, where can they go on LinkedIn to find you? So they can go to Solutions Marketing Group or they can go to Carmen Daniels Jones. I have a company LinkedIn profile as well as a personal one. Awesome. Carmen, thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure to talk to you, to hear your story and and just your experience over the years and that you're a Hamptonian like me. (laughs) Thank you. When did you come out? I came out in, oh, let's see, this age here, 1995. Okay. Yeah. A, a little bit after me. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> Usually people are like, oh, no, I wasn't even there yet when I tell people. When I came <laughs> well, if you weren't there, I was a dinosaur. So. Right. <laughs> Excellent. Now, before you go, a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners about anything. So I know that many listeners and especially new entrepreneurs are probably – feeling the trepidation that accompanies being um, self-employed. And there are probably people who are telling you, you know what, you should just go back in. <laughs> and in is, this, you know, where you worked as a teacher, going back to a corporate, you know, going back to a nonprofit, wherever in is, government. And I just want to encourage them to acknowledge the fear and do it. Feel, feel it, feel the fear and do it anyway. Um, it doesn't, you know, I'm not suggesting that you're careless or reckless, but you're going to be fearful. And if you're, and so be prepared for that. And as you're fearful to unearth that courage and to press through and do it, do it anyway. Excellent advice. Tony Robbins says you have to dance with the fear. You got to dance with it. Fear is a bully. I know. Cause I try to beat it up regularly. Right. <laughs> And you have to speak to it and you got to, you, you, you know, you respect it, but you got to overcome it. Right. Excellent. Carmen, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Hold on just a second. All right. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Thank you so much for listening. What you can do now is go over to support is sexy podcast.com to find other episodes with other inspiring women entrepreneurs that I've interviewed in the past. Check them out there. And while you're there, please also make sure that you subscribe to my email list so that you don't miss an episode. You don't miss any of the great resources that I share with people. I won't spam your inbox, only the good stuff. So be sure to go to support is sexy podcast.com. Click on 
subscribe at the top and sign up for our email list. And until next time, you know what to do. Go out there and create something sexy. And I'll talk to you soon. Take care.